excited to be here today seeing people in person. It's very exciting. Um, so obviously in today's turbulent landscape, there's never been a more important time for brands to back up their values with action and to take a meaningful stand on society's most pressing social, political, and environmental issues. And I think part of the reason so many of us are excited and inspired by working with brands is because of their storytelling power and their potential to shape and amplify narratives. Narratives around ownership, belonging, identity, feminism, womanhood, identity, the list goes on. But what exactly are narratives? How do they work? And what is the role and responsibility of brands in driving change forward? I'm super excited to have three brand experts with me on stage today. We've got Alex Weller, Marketing Director Europe at Patagonia, Ravi Amaratunga Hitchcock, co-founder of creative agency Soursop, and Nadine Ritter, independent brand strategist at We Are All Activists, as well as Isabel Crabtree Condor, who is a knowledge broker at Oxfam, and an expert on narrative power and social change. So before we open up the discussion to our brand experts to hear their insights from a marketing perspective, I want to just give the spotlight to Isabel to tell us a little bit about her research um, before we dive into the conversation. Thanks so much, Lucy. It's lovely to be here with you guys. Um, so um, I want you, I think we're talking to a lot of people online um, who are experts in storytelling, creating resonance um, around products, brands, and ideas. Um, and um, I really want you to take a step back from that day to day and think about how the knowledge you have um, can actually be contributing to, well, more consciously contributing to new narratives um, that uh, center around the ideas of equality, um, sort of freedom, uh, green, uh, greener kind of futures. Um, and I think that where um, what I've learned over the course of the, the last couple of years of doing this research and us going out and speaking to a lot of people um, who are in some way shaping um, uh, narratives, so narrative thinkers and doers, is that narratives are all about um, power. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit, about, bit more about what kind of narrative power means in a second. Um, but it's just thinking about how we can collectively promote values and ideas which are, um, yeah, furthering uh, equality, uh, justice, um, climate, environment, and protection of, of people. So um, you can see behind me, uh, narratives um, are, a, a, are made up of many, many stories that exist around us, and they really help us to make sense of the world. Um, so whereas uh, stories are told, narratives are known. So if we want to think about this in sort of branding terms, um, you know, you're using, uh, you're changing new na or creating new narratives around um, brands all the time. Imagine the complexity of changing what is known around these big ideas like society, the economy, uh, dignity, uh, inclusion, and diversity. So narratives are powerful because they act as activators. They're sort of neural shortcuts, if you like, um, hidden code for our brains. Um, and that can be problematic as well as a good thing. So it can be challenging when we see uh, anti-rights movements from around the world and also populist uh, politicians um, activating, um, using narratives, activating us on hate and spreading kind of fear. Uh, but equally, narratives can actually create um, connection and also mobilize people. Um, and those need to be sort of the more, uh, more focused on hope, uh, on empathy, um, that change is possible and that you can be part of it. So um, narratives that also keep ideas about what is possible in place. Um, and so, again, that's a problem, uh, but it also can be an opportunity because actually narratives can be a pathway to creating new options for doing things differently. So, for example, the idea that the world's, uh, the world's resources are completely infinite and we can continue using them um, at, like, and forever, or um, that we need to l learn to live within our planetary boundaries um, and respecting each other. Those are sort of two compo sort of different contrasting narratives. Um, so I like this idea um, because I think it really gets to the heart of what narratives are and how they operate. So they are um, operating often below the surface. Um, they're powerful, they're dynamic, um, they're not in our control. Um, and um, as a result, you know, you, you're going to have to find new ways of collaborating around new narratives or creating new narratives um, if we want to shape the narratives that are, that are out there. So I just want to finish with a couple of ideas uh, for our panel also to be thinking about um, in terms of yeah, what I've learned from our, my work in, uh, in civil society as part of civil society over the last couple of years related to narrative power and potentially the role that branding, uh, creatives, and marketing can, can play in that. 
So first of all, um, narratives aren't just what we say, they're also what we do. Um, so actually, implicitly or explicitly, knowingly or unknowingly, we're all actually shaping narratives on a daily basis, and we could definitely be doing a better job of it. Um, so that's something that's a real opportunity. Um, social change, <laughs> maybe stating the obvious, goes beyond a campaign. Um, so thinking about um, that social change and the processes that we want to contribute to with brand activism are long-term, they're non-linear, they're messy, um, and, um, and ultimately they maybe don't fit within our kind of, you know, an easily projectized form. Um, so how you show up is really important and being able to kind of contribute appropriately and find out what way you can contribute most appropriately is, really, is a really good place to start. So a good question for, for brands is often to consider your legitimacy on an issue. Um, and this relates a little bit also to the first point. Um, so are you well suited to the narrative uh, that you want to be shaping? Um, uh, is your way of working, your business practices, um, the way you're financed, um, are they going to cause you challenges with engaging with this narrative? Um, and I think related to this, not all of our activism needs to be visible. And that might sound a bit counterintuitive. Um, but actually, sometimes you can offer support in different ways. Uh, finally, keep a track on power dynamics. So this is something that's both important in terms of storytelling, who is elevated, who is visible, who is invisible, um, but also in terms of um, representation um, and ultimately, um, and, and also collaboration. So where we show up, how we show up, really recognizing that a lot of the issues that we want to be active on or activists on have actually got an existing ecosystem of, um, of groups who've been working on these a lot longer than it was trendy to do so. Um, how do you engage with them? in a way that really takes into account those power dynamics. Thanks. Thanks. I thought it was really valuable today to have, you know, we've had so many panels and conversations about brand activism, to actually have someone from civil society come and give us um, their two cents and to actually leave us with some potential takeaways at the beginning. But Ravi, I'm going to turn over to you from a marketing and brand perspective. Um, tell us, which brands do you see using their power to amplify, challenge, create new narratives? I think one brand that um, I think is doing it exceptionally well is Fenty. It's a celebrity-led um, brand, obviously, through, through Rihanna. But uh, it's not a single motion or it's not a single campaign that she focuses on. But every post, every uh, contributor, every person behind the camera is dedicated to you know, progressing social change and diversity in an amazing way. And I think also she's willing to make mistakes and has done in the past, but her audience are forgiving. And I think that's an important part of the activist journey. Should we have a quick look? Yeah. So what is it about Rihanna's Fenty that for you goes beyond a campaign? Well, I think she's managed to find a space where her business objectives and activism morph together. So she's carved out a really unique space that is her, provided all these opportunities, is making social change, but it's also how, helping her, her bottom line. And it's similar to what Isabel was saying, you know, do you have a right to be there and does it make sense? And so I think, you know, it's a young brand, but she's doing it so differently and is obviously driven by her own personality. But um, it doesn't feel disingenuous. So, yeah, it's a joy to see it come together. And uh, also, they just make great products. So. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for giving us also a concrete example. I'm going to turn to Nadine. Um, obviously, you're an independent brand strategist, so you work across a lot of different brands, um, both challenging and supporting them to take a meaningful <laughs> stand, um, which is why you're here today. And um, yeah, which brands do you see really pushing the dial and changing narratives? Um, well, there's a few, and there's, there's one of them already uh, represented over here. So uh, Patagonia, we will listen to Alex later. So I won't discuss um, this. I mean, it's good that you actually bring this up, being 
because I feel, especially lately, more as being a, a brand critic, criticist. I don't know if that's a word, but then um, because I think the the one thing that we haven't touched on is the actual questions of brands wanting to get into activism or uh, wanting to contribute towards positive change. Um, the real question is why do you actually want this? Um, and I think most brands have um, different reasons, but all very similar reasons as well. But the, the main thing for me about activism is that it has to be the, your goal to actually make political or social change um, should always be the reason why you exist. Or So if that's not the reason why you exist, if you exist because um, your main goal is profit, then you have to make some radical changes. And I think the transformation for most companies are um, not able to make that change. So I'm just being very honest about that. But um, yeah, I do really uh, uh, like a brand like um, Rihanna's brand, but I think it's also strong because it actually comes already from a, a brand that's a person and that's personal and mm -hmm. coming from someone with an activist mind. Um, but I think what we want to show now is a video from Lush. And the reason why I want to show this campaign specifically, like Lush is doing a lot of um, different um, activistic branding campaigns. So I think what's really important about their work is that it's not always literally related to um, their own agenda. So they're really, it's, it's almost like they're being more journalistic in a way. So this specific campaign is about um, the police spying on um, activists, like female activist groups in the UK, which is very problematic and very dangerous, um, and bringing it really far. So some of these police officers actually um, operated on their false identities and became romantic partners of these activists. And Lush actually, um, it's not about Lush bringing this story to the mainstream, it's about Lush supporting the actual activist groups that are already working on it. So for me, brand activism specifically, because I think it's a difference between purpose-driven brands and brand, activists, yeah. brand activism. So brand activism specifically for me is really about facilitating already existing movements. And I think if we look at what's happening today, a lot of brands really haven't done anything to support one of the most important movements right now, and that's the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. So I think there's a lot of opportunity that's uh, still lying around and nobody actually, uh, maybe not nobody, it's, it's mainly media brands who uh, do sometimes uh, help them. But or like the Instagram big brands, post. sorry, or an Instagram post from a brand, maybe not like. A, a yeah, that's not campaign. what I'm talking about. That's for me. That's not supporting. That's actually, um, of course. Uh, yeah. Before we jump into this sure. Lush um, campaign, yeah, you touched on the fact that they have gone far beyond their remit, um, touching on a lot of different issues, yeah. maybe even beyond the product relevance. Right. Yeah, I wanted to just ask you about that before we watch it. How far? Do you think that brands should go? What's their role in touching on so many different issues? Well, I mean, that really depends on what kind of brand you want to be, of course. And for Lush, it's always been very broad. So it's, it's never, like, their products are very, uh, uh, of course, the proof of everything that they claim to be. Also, if you look at the uh, sustainability, but also at the uh, more human side of things. Uh, but I think it's actually very interesting to, to position yourself as a brand that actually takes the role uh, uh, where they think that media is lacking to actually have take that responsibility to bring out some stories. So awesome. you have to be clear about it, obviously, but for, I think for Lush it works. Let's yeah. watch it. Uh, we have to click through. <laughs> Don't give up the day job. Seriously? You just have to take my word for it. I will. Yes, I will. <laughs> Thanks for dinner. It's fine. I didn't know you were wearing this. I love it. I love you. You know that, right?
something I'd always fear. Brilliant. And turning to our last speaker, Alex, you have the enviable job title of Marketing Director at Patagonia. Um, and I wanted to ask you, how do you navigate your role um, and that of the activists and causes you support to live up to your mission, we're in business to save our home planet? Big question. <laughs> it is a big question. Thanks, Lucy. Um, yeah, it's, um, it, it's, um, it's a difficult one. We work closely with a lot of different groups, working on a lot of really important topics and issues. And um, invariably, the groups or individuals, oftentimes, oftentimes we're talking about small, small grassroots environmental groups of maybe one or two or three people who have made it their life's work to, to focus on really important topics. And for us, as a relatively large company, to step in and stand bes <clears throat> beside these individuals and support them in their work uh, requires a lot of sensitivity. Um, it also requires understanding that um, there is a, a, a continuum, right? That these guys have to show up and do the work every day. And oftentimes they actually only have to, to lose once to lose for good. If I think about an issue um, uh, like the the work that we've been doing in the Balkan Peninsula of Europe on hydropower and the prevention of dam construction, um, a loosely organized, what was a loosely organized group of, um, of environmental activists and NGOs who have been working on this really important body of work for a long time. And so for us to um, take the decision to work with them and partner with them in their work means understanding deeply what it is that they're doing and what it is that they're trying to achieve but I think also understanding what is the unique thing that we can bring to bear um, to increase the chance of success and not to, I think, um, ultimately detract and, I think, claim that success for ourselves. And I think that's a really tricky balance to strike. And I think bringing it around to the question of narrative and narrative power, and to use the case study that I just mentioned to you, which, um, which was an initiative that we called Blue Hearts. In fact, I think the, what we saw as our unique opportunity was to help shape a more unifying narrative, and in actual fact, um, upturn what, had, what has been a commonly held uh, idea that hydropower is a net positive thing, right? That's the, that's the narrative. But by bringing into that conversation um, the idea that there is an, a, a deep ecological concern around the, the negative impact of, uh, of, of hydropower, we were, we, were at, we were able to partner with those groups to understand their needs and to reshape and lift that narrative to something else. But it is... It, but it is um, it's, it comes with a lot of responsibility, um, and you, I have learned uh, that you have to take, um, take that responsibility seriously and work with these groups for, and really understand them for a long period of time before you talk about embarking on some of these larger, more, more visible um, campaigns, if you like, and projects. Probably what makes Patagonia also quite different is that you, and I don't know the internal structure, of course, of your company, but you do have people dedicated to working on environmental activism internally, right? Like actual job descriptions. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we have an environmental initiatives department, if you yep. like, that's, that's, that's embedded within the company and has been for many years. And not only that, we have an ongoing process of granting um, uh, money, uh, and other types of resource uh, to uh, grassroots environmental groups. And many of these relationships have existed for multiple years, uh, some of them decades. And what that means is that when, I think when the time comes, when the opportunity presents itself, and often these opportunities are quite timely, to lean in a little bit more and to use the power of the brand to take that initiative closer to success, we've often been in close partnerships with these groups and, and working alongside these initiatives for some time. Yeah. Nice, a lot to learn. Um, let's watch an example. <laughs> Je suis à l'erreur, mais l'autre me fait pas le mot en CRT, c'est pas vous de pas faire, mais t'as ma vie de dire, 
që ky komunitet nuk mund jetoj goliku dhe shumë të golikut kur të lujit bësh kërëtir. When you imagine a river, it's basically the same as a tree. The main trunk is the river, but you have the branches, all the tributaries. On the Balkans, the whole river system is under attack. There is no other energy source that destroys nature on such a dimension as hydropower. These rivers are lifelines. All these communities, they would lose the basis of their existence. Communities that are resisting, that are fighting against hydropower plants, are coming together, are helping each other. Rivers have the power to unite people. No matter what nation they are, no matter what religion, the river is the same for everybody. If there is a Europe, you know, and we are connected, shouldn't there be something that we do not destroy? So I'm just, just going to throw a question out there and let's see where the conversation goes. Um, but I think, Nadine, you touched on a really interesting and s quite simple question. Why do businesses get involved in social, political and environmental issues? So I guess the first kind of big question I have is, should every brand be an activist? When should a brand take a point of view or a stand on a societal, environmental, social issue? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's again, it's a big question. I think, um, uh, I, I don't think it's really important what I think, to be honest, because from a moral perspective, I think so. From a, uh, uh, so, so, like, if you look what ha what's happening in society, if, if you look at what young people demand from brands, yes, you should. Uh, but I think it will only work in the end of the day if you as a company and the people who lead your company uh, truly feel that it's the right thing to do. And because I say it because um, with the whole idea of, of being an activist, there's, there's a big, um, there's a lot of resistance involved. So you have to be willing to pay the price. And it feels like a risk. I don't believe it's a risk because I feel if you stand for something and you act upon it, as you said, it's very important. Just the talking won't do. Like if you act upon it, if you uh, make sure your entire company and the way that you're organized, the way that your power structure is, because I think that's 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 something that we see now as well. If if we look specifically at the field of um, diversity, equality, there's a lot of representation representation shown uh, at the moment. So you see all campaigns and all media, there's a lot of different types of people. And I think it's a very good thing. It's a very good start. It's important. But if you look at the same companies and the way they're being led, it's still uh, very white, very male, very um, specific. So if you, if you really, if you as a company think it's important for us to be inclusive, to be diverse, um, you have to start with your power structure and you have to start with making space for other types of people, making space for other, other way of, uh, of managing or leading a company. So it's, it's such a big, big thing to change. That's what I meant at the beginning. Like if you're not, it's, it's a lot easier if you're born from an activistic, activistic uh, mindset, a reason that you actually want to change something and then you start building your company. But most companies, as I said, are not. They're just, you know, sure. profit-driven. So they have to transform. So, um, but I think the whole idea of being, it's, it's also what's, what's, what's difficult, I think, is that most brands are, will, are really used to being um, like the, the, the best kid in school or being applauded, like big brands like Coca-Cola, McDonald's, and it's very difficult for them to take a new position within the whole spectrum of actually being the bad guy and trying to transform the products that they once invented to something that it's not, to be honest. 
Uh, and so the, the small steps they take, people always say to me, but you know, you have to appreciate the small steps because they have a big uh, audience, they sell a lot of products, so small adjustments from brands like that will make a big impact, and I completely agree, uh, but I don't think they should, they should get any credits for it. They're still uh, part of the problem. They actually, the, a big reason why, why a lot of problems actually exist, so unless they are willing uh, to look in the mirror and to be very, really honest about what's going on. I, th I don't think they can ever make the transformation that they're actually aiming to make. So it's quite I contra contradictory. You touched in, in on something really interesting. It was a, a question I wanted to ask, which was that do brands expect too much from consumers to be thanked and applauded for their actions? Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> I think there's a reason there's brand activism and then there's straight activism, because brands are so used to getting credit for everything they do and having their logo at the end of everything, it's a complete mind shift to then be an activist versus, I mean, a good example is Marcus Rashford in the UK is doing this great Free School Meals UK campaign you know, against the British government. McDonald's are a company who are saying they're gonna step up alongside local businesses, but their product is bad for children. They then get a little backlash against that because they are kind of eating up a lot of air, you know, airwaves in terms of you know, they're enabling something, but they want to claim credit for it. So that's brand activism because there's almost like an oxymoron in yeah. the process of being a brand and an activist. You're a capitalist organization taking, but then you also want to give back. You want to make a profit, but you want to create, create a quality. So it's almost like branded content, right? There's like entertainment and then there's branded entertainment and they're separate because there's a brand word in it. And it'd be wonderful if we can get to a world where brands see themselves as a participant in a bigger cause rather than the start and end of, of an activist cause. I think in order to, <clears throat> to realize that the, the point that you made, really, that, 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 that capitalism is fundamentally broken, <laughs> right? Um, and, um, and as long as businesses are, serve one predominant objective, which is to, to deliver value to shareholders mm -hmm. or to accelerate the growth of their business in right. order to sell, then everything that follows behind that right. is subservient to that ultimate need. And until business itself mm -hmm. is prepared to, to reinvent and prepared to question and subsequently change the system, then a lot of these, these dynamics will continue to be driven by, by that ultimate priority. And one of, the, one of the outcomes of which is the constant need for positive affirmation and recognition right. by brands. Yeah, I, I just think that's such an important point. And if anyone watching takes one thing away from this conversation, yeah. it's that. It can, a lot can be solved with restructuring an organization, whether it's joining B Corp. Um, you're right, like not everybody's going to be able to have uh, Yvonne Chavanard uh, as, as its founder, but yeah coming back to your ultimate purpose would, would solve a lot of this, but yeah, sorry as no, well. I was just gonna say that um, you know, on narratives, if you take that bigger picture, kind of zoomed out version of this, um, it's not about you, um, <laughs> basically. You know, it's about collaborating and contributing. Actually, the, the, the title of, um, of this book is really specific. It's like narrative power and collective action. Mm. Um, and so it's thinking about, and, and there's so many varieties of how you can show up um, in that collective action. But I think that can be a really useful way. You know, if, if you can just take accept that maybe this is not about you and actually this is not something that you can necessarily hijack and use to make yourself more visible, then automatically your starting point for that collaboration is a totally radically different one, um, where listening is maybe the first thing that you do rather than going in assuming um, anything on behalf of the people that you want to want to be amplifying or collaborating with. Yeah. One of the first things that Isabel said to me was, um, no, brands cannot change a narrative. One brand cannot change a narrative. One company cannot change a narrative. And it helped me to understand this bigger picture of exactly what you said, which is going in and supporting um, existing movements and others. Um, so I wanted to ask you guys more on a personal level, <laughs> as the purpose-driven individuals that you are, which narratives you see being changed right now um, and how you think that brands could lend their power, platform influence to, to driving more action. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you've mentioned one already, um, the movement of Black Lives Matter and the movement in defense of black lives. For me, that's um, something that um, requires going and, again, listening to those groups and really hearing what is it that they want, um, how do they want brands to show up, if at all. Um, and I would say it probably comes, they'll probably say, come back to this point of 
well, how, how diverse is your board? How diverse is your senior management? Um, that's what we really care about, actually. And so again, that action speaking often louder than words and not expecting uh, to be uh, thanked necessarily for it because it's just pretty basic stuff. Um, so, um, you know, I think it's putting your money where your mouth is as well, ultimately. Like, if you are going to stand up and say um, you're standing with uh, movements like that, um, then you really need to be prepared to actually make the changes um, in your business model, in your structure, um, in your supply chain also, which we haven't touched upon. But these are all critical pieces to this. It's, it's, it's not only brands as well, it's agencies as well. I think, you know, they all want to do pro bono campaigns and you know, win can lions as a result. You know, there's always this kind of strange exchange going on. But one thing I'm involved in at the moment is taking myself away as a business owner and more as an individual. Uh, there's a POC um, community channel called Omro Sparts here that's um, trying to get off the ground. And just individuals have got together and try to put aside their day jobs and figure out how their individual skill sets can contribute to something collective. And that's the first time I've ever done that in my career, like not trying to use the brand or the company I'm working for, but just try and contribute your skill set. And I think that's a lot of what um, Isabel's work's about is, you know, there's a lot we can offer as individuals, not just as, as brands, and maybe think about that, your own personal activism, as well as, as well as that of the brands that you work for, that you're in bed with financially. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, a lot right now, I think, um, and um, I, I, could certainly, I could certainly talk to the Movement for Black Lives. I, I, I think one of the things that, um, that we all recognize, that you know, the political systems upon which we have sort of blindly depended for a long time are creaking on their foundations, and, and a lot of the um, demands for um, Things like citizen assemblies, for decentralizing power, for giving, um, uh, for I, let's say, sort of flattening out decision making. Um, I think a, a, a incredibly interesting movements, and you know, as 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 businesses, as, you know, as we think about what that means for us and and how we. Um, uh, enable more representative decision making it's 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 difficult even for businesses like ours that are built upon a mission businesses are quite kind of hierarchical by nature and d decision making tends to flow downwards not not upwards and i do think that that is one of the great changes in reimagining business that is required and I think a lot of companies right mm. now are using this moment in time this specific co covid moment in time to to stop and think, do we have the right structure mm. to navigate forward into a better future? Is the very foundation, the very structure that shapes the way that we work right? Can it be sustained and should it be changed? And, um, and I, I, I find that an, an incredibly exciting topic. I think people have also spoken about trust and transparency within companies as being a core value. And obviously, you know, in the time of COVID, when your employees are sitting at home, pedal to the middle. I mean, proof will be in the pudding. We'll see what happens. So it is a really exciting opportunity, I think, for reinvention. I don't want to have this conversation next year about the potential <laughs> of brands to drive change and what trouble the world is in. I think that this year should really be the moment um, for something to happen. Um, obviously, we're also seeing some backlash. Um, call out culture, uh, a lot of probably um, founders are also timid or, or, or afraid to put their, their brand to a cause. Um, and we obviously don't want to see this huge powerful entity which is business step out of this space. So do you have any advice for those that are trying to navigate, you know, we have a company, yes, we're here to, to drive profit, but what could we possibly do? I think there's huge potential in more brands stepping in to be activists, maybe I'm wrong. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, for me, for me personally, it's a big one and I always, because I think there's a lot of lack of this as well, I think uh, the next step would be there, there should be shown some vulnerability because I saw someone the other day, who quote, I think it was a, a writer, um, Tofik Divi actually is a Dutch writer and he said, the only person who can call me out is God. And I really love his answer because he, what he actually meant, what I read in it, was the only person that can call me out is me. Like, 
the, the fact that people or brands are scared of call, call out cultures because they know they have something mm -hmm. um, to hide. They know have, they have something they can't explain. So that's okay because again, if you're structured that way, if you were born in a different age and, and you have to make a lot of changes, but just be very honest about it and be, be open about it, be vulnerable, just, just let people know what you're doing. And I don't think, um, I don't think anyone can take you, uh, uh, I mean, still critique will be there and it will be deserved, but that's, for, I always compare it to personal relations as well. If you're, uh, if you identify as an activist, then people will have critique as well. And what I always do, because I get critique sometimes and I hopefully uh, I will uh, continue to receive critique because that's how I learn, of course. And I always say, um, thank you, I will think about this and I will, because sometimes when I put out an initiative or something, some people will say, I don't think this works. And then, um, yeah, that's, you have the right to feel that my approach doesn't work. Uh, and I think about it, I seriously reconsider and then I can still decide for myself to stay with my idea because I feel it's the right idea, but I, I have listened and I have taken it seriously, but it hasn't, like, I, I didn't immediately think like, oh my God, someone disagrees with me because that's, but that's what I mean, like, that's the area where you are as, as a brand wanting to, you know, standing for something means that people are also being very critical about things that you do. and. I mean, if you say, okay, okay, you're doing this and this, but why do you fly or why do you, wh wh you don't eat meat or animals, but why do you wear leather? You have to have these answers to yourself as well. So mm -hmm. as a company, you have to have these answers to your audience, just the same thing. So it's all about being honest, being able to look in the mirror and being just very vulnerable. And then no one can really touch you, I believe, personally. And I think that engagement that you show on a personal level to stop and listen is probably a big mm -hmm. lesson for brands to stop, engage, I don't know, focus groups or even responding on Twitter to, to exactly, people calling yeah. them out and, yeah. and engaging. Yeah, but also like a lot of when something like, like um, when a backlash happens, it's always the reaction is they either apologize or uh, they just try to make it stop immediately. But if you're just being honest about the process, like what happened and uh, even like with really big cases like the Pepsi case um, with Kendall Jenner, I think it's already two years ago or something, uh, with a big backlash that it just disappears off. Like, it's the same actually with Nike, what happens now. Nike, of course, has the big campaigns around um, with Colin Kaepernick, um, uh, basically supporting him in his, uh, in his um, battle. Uh, at the same time, the Instagram uh, Black at Nikes um, was there with a lot of, uh, so that's like a grassroots thing, right? People that anonymously can tell their stories, how it actually is to be black and be working at Nikes. And now this Instagram has like disappeared somehow. I just recently found out and I think it's very scary, but I don't know, I don't blame Nike. I don't know what happened, but I think from their perspective, they should now, it's not enough to say, oh, we don't know what happened. It's their responsibility if they wanna operate within this field and be taken seriously to actually help the people or whoever has something to say to facilitate this conversation again, publicly. I think that's you know, your role. Um, so yeah. Um, there was a recent example of that, I think, with a, a work by a creative agency, um, the head of a creative agency, but it was more an artwork called Destroy My Face. And there were a lot of women that were really upset and we didn't see a lot of public engagement um, with those. So I just wanted to give a little bit of airtime to that cause. <laughs> um, I'm gonna ask all of you just for one final message. So what is, what is your main message for brands looking to authentically and legitimately embrace, enhance, or shape new narratives going forward. So I'll start with Isabel, our narrative expert. No <laughs> pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I want to touch on something that Nadine just mentioned, which is the power of conversation. So like, you know, why are we so scared of call-out culture? Why are, we so scared, why are we so scared of entering into those conversations and actually hearing what the other person has to say? If we go in thinking that we're right and they're wrong, like that is not a place where you can come to a useful point of collaboration or, or even to understand someone else's reality. So I think that that's something that can really help shape uh, collaboration um, in this space. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's. I think it's a. Di it's a difficult thing for brands to embark on. I. You know. What I would say is. Find a true purpose. Commit to that over time, 
and then you know really work out how to meaningfully articulate that and authentically connect that to your you know to the to the outside world to real people to customer communities but i i i believe that the first step has to be internal the first step has to be about businesses understanding their true purpose beyond possibly just the products that they make and 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 t to your point Nadine understanding how to ha have that honest conversation with yourself mm -hmm. as a group of business people before you embark on having that conversation publicly and i think that's uh, that would be my one small piece of advice <laughs> similar i think you know looking in the mirror making sure you want to commit to a long-term journey and upfronting cash and knowing that you're going to provide that to people that need it as opposed to things that might necessarily benefit your brand. If you still want to be engaged on all of those fronts, then go for it. If not, maybe activism isn't for you. So having an honest conversation and maybe not getting involved if it's not the right thing, I would say. Nice, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, just be, be honest, be curious, and be humble. I think that's the, that's the main thing. Great. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for taking time out of your day to have this conversation and to share your knowledge um, with the thousands of people tuning in live. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, thank you, and thank you on brand. Thank you. Thank you.